G'day guys, Mackie with the Outer Circle. I can't help but feel that I need to revisit the uh, idea of Games Workshop's fluff. That is, the backstories behind the events that are happening in the 40k universe. I decided that I would try and do this logically, edition by edition, um, and mostly focusing on 40k because it would take forever if I also included fantasy and uh, the numerous other games that they've produced over the years. Now, this all started out pretty simple. I have a paper script next to me, which I write down before I do most of my What Broke the Fans videos, where I put in general notes, things like that, that may be important, um, and things I need to focus on as I talk. And the more I wrote, the more things just went off course. So I tidied it up a little bit, and I'm mostly going to try and stick to the script, so I don't go too far off, uh, off the beaten track, as it were. So, with that in mind, Rogue Trader and 2nd Edition. Rogue Trader, or First Dead 40k, for those who don't know, was very, very self-aware. It was actually the bastard love child of 2000 AD, that's uh, Judge Dredd comic books, and uh, the pop sci-fi of the time. It somehow blended elements of uh, Alien, Aliens, Dune, Terminator, Blade Runner, Judge Dredd, and many other concepts together. and it did all this in one run. The cover art for some of their box sets was <laughs> simply amazing and was very tongue-in-cheek, often homaging uh, film and actors. One image directly ripped off Pacino from Scarface, the classic say hello to my little friend scene. This trend continued into second edition, but second edition started to take itself a little bit more seriously. Background was fleshed out, factions started to develop very distinct identities, and the tones started to darken. A lot of the really colourful paint schemes that you saw from first edition, they started to disappear. Things like the old Rainbow Warriors, they went the way of the squad, and uh, Space Marines themselves became superhumans. Weapons got assigned to specific factions um, and specific races. You see, Back in First Ed, technically you could have like shuriken catapults on Space Marines and some other weird shit, las guns. But yeah, all of that sort of got codified and very much the tone for 40k got set then and there. Third edition. Third edition was where things got pretty serious. The fluff actually became cemented, the entire codex range was rewritten specifically for that edition. Right? Many of you know that with 8th edition coming, the entire range of current codexes and army books is becoming invalidated. Told you so. Um, and that happened in 3rd edition. Everything that had come before uh, was basically scrapped and started over. Not the fluff as much as just the factions themselves, because being a very different game to, third, uh, to 2nd edition, the 3rd edition codexes had to be written for that edition. New factions were included, and many existing factions were finally fully fleshed out. Some of these factions included the Tyranids, the Dark Eldar, the Necrons, and the Tau, all of which existed in some capacity, but were isolated to just a few units, such as Crute, or even just three or four models. Uh, the Necrons only had, I believe, Scarabs, Warriors, Destroyers, Immortals, and the Necron Lord uh, in 2nd edition. And by the end of 3rd edition, they had a fully fleshed out codex. The fluff at this time was very, very dark. Um, everything focused on the Imperium teetering on the edge of a knife, and most races were on their own brink of extinction at the hands of any number of nameless terrors. This was the time where Chaos and Tyranids were certain to wipe the galaxy, and over the edition, this was really, really rammed home. At the same time as 2nd and 3rd edition was happening, a little game called Necromunda came along. This is a spiritual successor to uh, both Laserburn and Confrontation, which were earlier skirmish games that Games Workshop did. It was a game based around unique and interesting drug gangs warring in the underhive of a hive called Necromunda. This is incredibly close to the tone of Rogue Trader, um, being very self-referential, very self-aware. Um, had its own unique humor style, and it's worth mentioning here because it was one of the last times where the 40k universe was treated with some levity. If you want to know what it was like, look at Robocop, the original 87 Robocop, and that'll give you some kind of an idea. 
in fourth edition, the edition ended up in a strange place. Unlike third edition where every codex was rebuilt from the ground up, many of the fourth edition codexes simply carried over. Chaos started out supreme thanks to the vaunted 3.5 codex, and there was a worldwide campaign based around the 13th Black Crusade. This campaign was the defining event of the edition, with the galaxy beginning to fall. Shit was getting real. All of a sudden, it stopped. The dark stopped. Some hope started to creep back into the 4th edition codexes, and instead of a doom to fall mentality, there was a resigned stalemate. 4th edition also marked the beginning of power creep in 40k, but that's another story for another day. You see, 4th edition, unlike 3rd edition, was the first uh, edition to really carry over the existing books. This was when Games Workshop really had to sort of focus on making FAQs and a lot of the books started to creep away from one another. Um, certain books, Necrons, uh, Dark Eldar, things like that, they became limbo books. They just didn't get touched in the edition, the developers just went good enough and kept them as they were. This is important later when you come back to them. See, because the next thing that happened is 5th edition. The Imperium started to take the fight back to the enemy in this edition. In Codex after Marine Codex, they kicked ass left and right, flawlessly beating all their enemies. And then, at the end of every book, we'd be told, Oh, oh no, but the Imperium is just so weak compared to their enemies. That's why we just told you about the Marines just kicking untold ass for 40 pages and never losing a battle. You see, somehow you're meant to buy the Grimdark. Sure. At the same time, you've got codexes like Tyranids. They went from being the scariest, much HR Geigery swarm of endless enemies destined to conquer the galaxy, to just a beating stick. Every conflict they came into, they'd lose. They not only lost, but they lost in their own fucking book. And then, just like Marines, they had a token sentence at the end of the book like, Oh, but there's always more. Like somehow that makes up for all the atrocious fluff in the book. Many at the time felt that the game was in a solid place, but with Drago's Tale of Bullshit, the Neucrons, the Wolfie Wolves, the edition wasn't the finest in fluff. If you notice that the fluff was degrading in 5th edition, you'd also notice that the novels were changing in tone. The Horus Heresy novel series was taking a very serious look at things, whilst the 40k novels varied on an individual basis. And at this point in time, along came 6th edition. And two weeks into 6th edition, two things happened. The first was the 6th edition Chaos Codex, the first codex of the edition, and the second thing was the Horus Heresy series from Forge World. Now, two approaches were taken here. The Chaos Codex tried to be a more serious book, setting what we hoped would be the tone for 6th edition. The Dark Angels followed soon after and they were pretty much the same style. Things looked promising at this point. Sadly, Codex Tau followed this and it was a grim affair. You see, the Tau are a very young faction. That's their fluff, and it's kind of true on the tabletop. I mean, they've been around for nearly 20 years, but we'll call it true. Now, their fluff is progressing at a rate of knots. The ethereal cast are becoming communist dictators using population control and mind control agents to run their society. Oh, spoiler warning. Um, but all this has done is made one of the only hopeful bright sparks in the setting into yet another grim Dower faction. It makes them more like their contemporaries. And it's more insulting because considering that the events of 40k aren't taking place over a huge long period of time, relatively speaking, but over the closing years of the 41st millennium, vast fluff changes like this shouldn't be occurring. Now, looking back to the Horus Heresy that I mentioned earlier, at the same time as 40k is starting to get a bit of a clusterfuck, the Horus Heresy is playing it straight. It reads more like a history book, like the modern day Lord of the Rings, the appendices of it. The factions are treated equally, well, mostly, with the tension equally divided, and their goals make sense. This is further supported by the most high quality uh, book series that Games Workshop has, the Horus Heresy series. Arguments can be made for things like Gotrek and Felix, but I'm a Horus Heresy man. Now, when I say attention was equally divided and their goals make sense, this is because every single legion 
is enjoyable to some degree, right? In 40k, a lot of factions um, are hit and miss. Their fluff just doesn't work for people, or, you know, maybe their rules don't work for people. In the Horus Heresy, there was none of that, right? The earliest books especially, everything felt balanced. It wasn't like there was an auto must-have or must-include faction. And that's important. That's important to the game. Now, the next thing we have happen is 7th edition. So, keeping in mind, the Horus Heresy is maintaining its course throughout 7th. And this is the, well, this is what I want to call the experimental edition of 40k. This edition focused on extending the 6th edition stories. But instead of treating them with gravitas, they gave them to a group of writers who don't seem to understand the fluff. Let's expand on this for a moment. Writers on TV series like Stargate, Star Trek, etc. They understand their fan base pretty well. They have extensive lists with the canon stories um, written on these lists and important names and events are listed there and they're not rewritten and retouched, right? The canon is well respected and even if they take it in a different direction over time as they flesh out the story arc, they keep it in mind, they keep the heart and soul. Let's look at how 40k does it now. Instead of keeping their canon, they rewrite the fluff as it suits their needs. The staff seemingly in total agreement with each other in some sort of pretentious cycle. They write events that are constantly resolved by Dowsek Machina, or cool for the sake of cool events. Unlike Rogue Trader where that was fine because it was a satirical story, right? Self-aware had a laugh at itself. This is going on in what Games Workshop is trying to sell as a super serious, dark sci-fi setting. We have stories of people being stored like fucking Pokemon by Necrons, avatars of Kane being used in a codex um, as a dick measuring, uh, you know, a measuring stick for characters' dicks. And let's face it, you're not a real 40k general unless you've killed an avatar in combat, right? Yawn. And, and that's what they are. Alongside the codexes, you have designers stamping the visual style of the game with this pretentious new fluff. Let's look at a quote from the sculptor about Magnus the Red's demon Primark model in 40k. Zench is often depicted as a serpent, but who is the skeletal form? Magnus himself, perhaps? Or the Emperor? Fucking pretentious much? Mate, it's sculpting a fucking bright red demon Primark. Jesus Christ. The skin on Magnus's right arm has split to show mechanical pipes, suggesting bionic augmentation. Legend has it that during Magnus' duel with Lehman Russ, the Wolf King broke Magnus' arm. Could these bionics that replaced his sh shattered bones and torn muscles? Look, Mr. Sculptor, let me point some things out to you. Now, I'm only a human, but I can heal a broken arm. A shattered one? Maybe with surgery. Magnus is not a human. He's a Primarch. They can heal bullet wounds in seconds, shrug off swords through chests, but he needs bionics to fix a broken arm. Another thing. Magnus, he's a Biomancer. Thousand Suns could literally cure cancer with their mind. Wolgar could heal himself from being blasted by a Titan Plasma Blast Gun. Magnus, he decides, however, the best his approach is to stuff conduit tubing into his arm to the point of bursting. What? He's a fucking demon prince, is my last point. He could shapeshift before demonhood, he can shapeshift still. He can... He can't fix a broken arm? He's not a material creature. He's a demon from another dimension. <laughs> like... Here's the thing, the fluff is contradicting the sculpt. And you're trying to create your new fluff as the sculptor. That's not your fucking job as a sculptor. Your job is to put the fluff into a visual style, right? To actually portray that fluff visually. You're not. You're doing your own thing with the fluff, right? And changing the fluff and twisting it and warping it to suit what you think looks cool. That's not how it works. This is the type of person who's working for Games Workshop. They know the fluff, yes, but they can't seem to reconcile it, and it pops my mind. 
Some more examples here. Chaos aren't malevolent villains with unending schemes and machinations and the darkest threat. They're instead played as a mismatch of disorganized followers who do a personality 180 at the drop of a hat, or a plot device. Chaos were once driven with a goal in mind. They won't stop until they reach it, look out any who stand in their way. Because despite being a bunch of ill-disciplined marines with personal goals, they're still fucking superhuman soldiers with millennia of war experience and a grudge to suit. Treating them like they can't get things done is just insulting. Another thing, the webway being used as a plot device throughout the gathering storm, that was painful. It was once a really treacherous place in a lot of the novels. Like entering a cave with only one safe route but 200 different paths. You might make a wrong step and end up in demon infested sections or stumble into a dark Eldar raiding party or just be lost for time eternal. But now, why it's the number one way to travel. It's page one in the How to Write Yourself Out of a Plot Hole. A book currently being written by Games Workshop, I'm pretty sure. Now, what about bringing back the Primarch? A dower ceremony? Did he heal himself? Or is it the armor that keeps him alive? No, no. Instead, it's Chaos Space Marines are randomly thrown to room, and the Eldar use their spirit powers to realign Gilliman's chakras. Sure, why not? Gilliman traveling all around the realm of Ultramar takes away the danger of warp travel. When suddenly the warp doesn't present a menace again, or sorry, when it does present a menace again, it's too contrived. At least in the Horus Heresy, the turbulence in the warp caused by the world eaters and word bearers rampaging across hundreds of worlds and sacrificing them in a dark ritual leads to a maelstrom, right? Leads to what they call the Ruin Storm that cuts off the Ultima section, uh, Sector from the light of the Astronomicon and Terra. That, to me, makes sense. But in Gathering Storm, oh no, warp storms just happen on a chaotic whim because reality can only take so much. The fluff has reached a stage where people are eye-rolling. It's not to say that all fluff is universally terrible, because it's not. It's just the tone is all over the place. We can easily buy the events of the Horus Heresy, uh, except maybe the whole perpetual cabal story arc, that's just piss. But the Primarchs, they're Marines. They seem real. They have fears, they have doubts, unique personalities. In 40k, characters seem to have abrupt personality changes as the story dictates. Instead of one event logically leading to another, it's like there's a mandated requirement for X amount of cool things in happening involving Y models that have to happen on the way. This is coupled with a general trend towards many miniatures being more cartoonish in their design aesthetics, because what happens in one affects the other. Here is where we get to the point of all this, and I am sorry it's taken so long. I did warn you that this would get out of hand. You see, the tone in 40k is all over the place right now, with fluff being full of oxymorons. On the one hand, there's the darkness of chaos waiting to overwhelm the galaxy. But this same darkness is disorganized. They're only a threat because they feel the need to constantly remind us that they are a threat. We don't arrive at that conclusion naturally because all evidence points to the otherwise. On another hand, there is the failing Imperium. Yet they win all their battles. The heroes are the greatest and actually achieve their goals. When was the last time a major named hero died? Marnius Kelgar, Dante, people like that? It doesn't happen, does it? It's at the point where you can assume that one of those named characters, if they're involved, then it's probably going to work out alright for the Imperium in the end. There needs to be some kind of campaign map shown throughout 40k, perhaps showing the inroads cut into the Imperium by Zeno and Chaos. Like a World War I documentary, where you can see the Germans swing through Belgium as they implement the Schieflin plan. When we hear the Black Templars were wiped out in Cadia, we might almost say, Oh no! But we know there are a massive crusading chapter spread around the stars and that, again, none of their named characters died. So really, their involvement led to nothing. I want to point out though, I started writing my notes for this bit I just went through about the map and, you know, inroads cut into the Imperium by Chaos. And I did that Wednesday last week. What happened on the weekend, though, was that this very thing kind of happened. They released a map for seventh, uh, sorry, eighth edition 40k, which shows a map, 
uh, with the events, the changing landscape of the galaxy on it. And although not perfect, hey, it was something I asked for, and I feel the need that as I make this very video to point that out. Now, on a third, and this time chord hand, the Tyranids, as yet, have failed to show up. When they do, every time, some world we're told is very important gets eaten. But then in a predictable pattern, they rock up on a named planet, fuck it over, but ultimately lose, right? Our heroes are left standing around after the battle, lamenting in a very pseudo-intellectual way. We've won, but at what cost? Like somehow we're meant to be on the edge of our seats, like it hasn't happened six fucking times already. Free advice for the future, G-dubs. Next time, have the Tyranids make a territorial gain, and don't wipe them out. At least let it go over a campaign series. Have them building up their forces, readying for the major Zerg rush, with the Imperials trying to hold back Chaos desperately on one side of the galaxy, but knowing they have to deal with the looming threat on the other, and knowing that they can't win. On the last of my Vishnu-like hands, you have the Alliance Autism Spectrum. Alliances come and go on a whim. You have the Dark Eldar being BFFs with the Eldar. Why? Sure, they're the same species, but look at our own planet, Earth. Plenty of times the same species here won't work together to fight mutual enemies. Most creatures are selfish, self-preservations in mind. I'm fine with them occasionally working together, but they do it a little bit too easily, it's too contrived in these books. Being 100% allies it doesn't work for me. They really need to focus on them as just a side note in stories, keeping an eye on each other the whole fucking time. The alliance system in both the actual tabletop and in the books, it's problematic. It's just the fluff swings violently in either direction like it's bipolar constantly. The tone of 40k is clearly a clusterfuck. It's not grim dark anymore. And it's, no matter what some people say, it is not having a laugh at, at itself. It's not self-aware. It's trying to be taken very, very seriously, right? But it's being handled by incompetent writers. The last laugh sale when the Dark Elder character, uh, Cruella the Vile, was deleted. Whoever the people are in charge of these books now, and who knows since they omit writers' names, they need to sit down and actually set out a more even tone across the board. The deus ex machina moments are cringeworthy, the plot contrivances are frustrating, the use of most factions as punching bags to the Imperium is positively laughable. If you want to present 40k as serious sci-fi, that's fine, but you need to dial back the Mary Sue aspects of the game, and actually have someone who isn't a Space Marine fanboy who says, how cool is this idea? I'll just add it to the story that doesn't suit it. You need to get that rid of that guy, because they're working on every book right now. My number one suggestion here is to have a fluff master like Alan Bly in charge of the overall books. The Horus Heresy game books from Forgeworld are very consistent, and for this reason they have one person overseeing it all. On top of this, if I learned anything from the Games Workshop writers I've spoken with lately, and I've spoken with a few actually, they seem to blindly support one another and back each other 110%. And that's very funny because often they'll do it at the expense of fluff they themselves might have written. Andy Hoare, who wrote the original uh, fluff for the Death Watch, said he liked what uh, Phil Kelly did with it. And when we questioned him on why the changes were necessary, he had nothing to say, he just said, oh, I like what he's done with it. Right? He didn't say that it needed to be done, or that it wasn't changed for the sake of change, he said he just didn't mind the fluff. You've got to be critical. These writers are living in, they're living in an echo chamber, where one of them turns to the other, and he could have written anything, no matter how crap, and everyone else just turns around and says, yeah, that's great, that's awesome, dude. And that's why our fluff is all over the shop, why the tone is all over the shop. One last little note at the end here. I just wanted to say which writers I'm sick of writing codexes, and who have to stop writing codexes and wasting game resources. Sadly, it's pretty much all of them. Phil Kelly's best days were in 4th edition. He's a shameless Eldar fanboy who ruins other factions. Robin Crudus is a treadhead who only seems to understand Imperial factions, and even then, only certain ones. Matt Ward is back. Sure. He needs to be kept away from fluff and stories entirely, and he is only allowed to write rules if he's writing the entire system. Because, in his defense, 
His codexes are fantastically balanced against one another and internally, but are incredibly unbalanced against anything he didn't write. Jeremy Vedok, on the other hand, he seems to be flying suspiciously under the radar, so I'll give him a pass. I'm Maka with the Outer Circle. Please leave your thoughts and comments below. And I do apologise for this being a bit of a clusterfuck. Unfortunately, I got GW's writers to help me out with this, and clearly, you know, things just didn't go as planned. Thanks all for watching the episode, and I'll see you all next time.